Thank you. Great. Okie dokie. So, um, yes. So, and also if you've got questions and you're too shy to say them in person, then you can always put them in the chat and, um, and Sunny can read them out for you as well. Uh, so how very exciting to meet you all uh, today and that we can embark on this six week adventure together, the inner adventure, the very best of all of them. Um, so uh, the course healing anxiety and depression. And the first thing we've got to really ask is, is it even possible? Because what's the point of looking at all of this horrible stuff and trying to do something about it, if in the back of our mind we, we think it's just even, it's not possible to heal. And, um, you know, from a Western point of view, we might kind of come a, a, across on a huge range of things from hoping that we can heal it to thinking, no, it, we just got to learn to make do um, or just to ignore it or distract ourselves. But actually, according to Buddhist psychology, the insights of the Buddha, it is possible to completely heal ourselves from anxiety and depression. We can do something about it. We can also learn to live with it at the moment and work with it. But, but the end point is it is possible to completely rid ourselves of all forms of suffering and unhappiness. So the Buddhist psychology is very radical. It's... Um, you know, we, we hear about this and that and we think, oh, that sounds nice. But actually the, the Buddha, according to me, was like the ultimate punk, you know, completely radical, really, really out there. And the methods that we can employ um, are radical and incredibly effective. So hopefully in this course, I'll be able to introduce you to these. I mean, it's, it's going to take more than six weeks, right? We're not I mean, maybe we'll be enlightened at the end of six weeks, but at least at the end of six weeks, we'll have some tools of what to do and some real confidence and enthusiasm for being able to do that inner task. The other good thing about Buddhist psychology is you don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't even have to be religious. You just have to have that uh, courage and honesty to look within. You can be a 1% Buddhist, that's fine. You just take what's useful apply it and see if it helps. That's all you need to do. You don't have to turn yourself into someone else or something else. So the, the course came about because, uh, and I've got to say, when we lead this course at Lovery Tomba Centre, it's for all these years, about 15 or 17 years I've been leading it, um, it's been our most popular course, <laughs> which is really awful, isn't it? It says a lot about the state of the world that this is every single time the most popular course. So why? Because either we ourselves have experienced anxiety or depression. Some of us may be really, really chronic, or we may live with someone that's undergoing anxiety or depression. And that also is, can be incredibly debilitating, really challenging. Uh, we might find that we get um, bullied by our afflictive states of mind, uh, that we get easily kind of thrown off our inner journey. We may also find that, yeah, we do have good qualities, but they're so mixed up with, uh, with, with our bad characteristics or they get corrupted really easily. So what can we do about those? So the interesting thing, for instance, with anxiety and depression is that um, neurologically, there is no difference between, for instance, anxiety and anticipation. Neurologically, what's going on in the brain is exactly the same. And yet we experience them so differently. The, the difference between anticipation, looking forward to something, and anxiety, so debilitating. Why is, why is there that difference? Why do we experience them differently? So that's what we're going to have a look at. So I'm going to get up the screen share and just outline the trajectory of the course, and then we can do a little motivation, a little meditation to, to set our deep purpose for being here. Um, 
so sorry, it's a six week course. That one says eight, typo already. So the outcomes of the course. First off, we're gonna have a look at the science of the mind, Buddhist psychology. Buddhist psychology starts with this inner science, a really uh, sophisticated understanding of how our mind works, of what, what our nature is, who we actually are, what our potential is as human beings, what we can become. And I mean, we've all had questions about this, but whether we've come to a conclusion that is in step with reality or whether we've really underestimated ourselves or whether we're just full of doubts. So understanding that the science of our, of our mind, that's fundamental, that's like the ground. And it's got nothing to do with belief, which is great. It's evidence-based. <laughs> so we'll have a little touch on that today. The main part of the course is about this map of the disturbing emotions, how they arise. And if we understand how the disturbing emotions arise, then we can find the treasure. What's the treasure? Peace, emotional freedom. We often get uh, lost if, if we don't have a map of how the disturbing emotions arise. We can put a huge amount of effort into trying to fix ourselves, into trying to deal with what we think the problem is. But if we've misidentified the problem, doesn't matter how sincere we are or how much effort we put in, it's not going to work. So the way to deal with the disturbing emotions isn't to necessarily counter them by force and trying to force ourselves to be good <laughs> it's actually to undo them then we have a real chance of finding the treasure that inner peace that we just long for so um we'll have a look at the map today After that, when we've actually seen how these disturbing emotions arise, we're going to spend a class or two on the, on the biggies, the ones that I call the big bullies. <laughs> so craving and dissatisfaction, how it just bullies us, it overwhelms us. Anger, frustration, resentment, that too. Once it gets started, it's very difficult to stop. So what we can do about it. Issues of identity, self-loathing is a huge one in the Western society. Um, just confusion, confusion, doubt, muddle-headedness. All those things like procrastination, everything come into there too. So these, the really big ones that dominate us and, and bully us, how can we overcome them? And... Also, we're going to spend a couple of classes on how to actually listen to what anxiety and depression are telling us. What's the hidden message? And uh, Buddhist psychology has some very radical methods for dealing with this that are quite different from the Western methods. And I think together they work very well. The Western methods for dealing with anxiety and depression um, they help in the short term, but they don't actually cure us. But there is, there is a way to completely heal. So at this point, I'm just gonna stop and I'm going to give you a disclaimer and a guarantee. <laughs> so two things. So the disclaimer is, if you're on medication, don't stop your medication. Medication is necessary and it's good. And this isn't a substitute for medication. And in fact, we're fortunate that we have medicine, medication that we can take because it helps uh, prepare the ground. It helps open the doors and the windows that we can do the inner work. Lama Yeshi often said, you've got to be really strong to be a Buddhist. Why? Because we are working on our mind and we're working on these deep fundamental principles. So we need to be strong. So if we are currently overcome by depression and anxiety, then we've got to help ourselves <laughs> and support ourselves. So medication's essential for creating the window of opportunity. Um, 
So I'm even going to go further with that, my disclaimer and say, so especially if you're beginning to feel better, don't stop your meds. <laughs> because that's like taking the support away before it's had a chance to work. So keep them up. That's the first one. Then the guarantee. So there's not many guarantees that you get in life, but I'm going to give you one. I'm going to stake my name on it. So I found um, over the years of leading this course that if you do the worksheets and they're, they're included in the notes, they're only a page each class. If you actually fill, print them out and fill them in, physically write in the answers. This course is a life-changing course. Um, because you just get started. And once you get started, then changes happen, transformation happens. Um, so the, the, it's not a huge amount that you have to write. I purposely only just put a couple of lines but it's really important that we get it started because it is quite difficult to, to gather your thoughts and to put things into words and to put them down, to capture those words, to capture those feelings and put them down in writing. But that actually integrates all of this because otherwise what happens is that we hear what you know we talk about in the class or we read the books and we understand and we go, yeah, that makes sense. And we start knowing more and more and feeling more and more miserable. <laughs> and I don't want that to happen. So just knowing how our suffering comes about isn't enough. We have to use that information. And it's, it's, um, it's almost like the curse of the intelligent, you know, that you can understand more and more. And at the same time, you see, oh, but my life is getting worse and worse. And it can be very demoralizing. So the, the way through that is to do the homework. <laughs> So I've, I've called it reflection sheets so that you don't get scared of the word homework. Um, but it's really important that you do it, that you fill it in. Okay. So, and because actually, so when people have done this course, the ones that didn't do the homework, um, they just said, oh, yeah, it was a really interesting course. Um, but the ones that did do the homework, a um, couple of things happened. One is that it was life-changing. And the other is that in a few years' time, you can come back and do it again and you can compare your notes and you can see there is absolute positive proof there that you've progressed, that you've changed, and you get a real kick out of it. So because we're online, we probably can't do the... Um, the welcome so easily but what I'd like us to do for the motivation is to just take a moment to um, get comfortable to sit up relatively straight so make sure that your lower back is supported but your spine is fairly straight and we'll just do a little meditation to adjust our motivation So the, the, the easiest way to have a posture for meditation is to imagine that from the, um, the base of your spine up through your body and coming out the crown of your head is a fine thread of light and feel as if you're being supported from your crown by this thread of light. So you find your spine naturally aligns, your posture becomes more alert especially if you've had a long day already, you can feel that all the weight of your body is supported by this fine thread of light from your crown. That you're effortlessly uh, sitting upright. And then once you're supported like this, then you can let your shoulders drop and release the tension from the neck and the shoulders. And if you find that quite hard to do, then try and lift your shoulders up and touch the the bottom of your earlobes there with your shoulders and go tight, 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 and then let them drop. It's a really good before and after and a great way to relieve tension. So squish the shoulders up, 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 and then let them drop. Become present in the room. Even though the rest of the world may be quite busy around you, here you are sitting quietly in your room. 
And so too internally, even though your mind might be swimming, there might be all sorts of thoughts and emotions and everything, just have your focus become aware of the rising and falling of the breath. Just that one thing. If you get distracted, that's okay. Bring your focus again back to the breath. Anything you become aware of, you can note it, but then let it go. Bring your focus back to the breath. Any inner dialogue, any thoughts or feelings, experience them like clouds in the sky. They arise, they manifest, but then they naturally dissolve. So you can say, oh, thought or feeling, and then just put it aside. Just have your main focus, that gentle rising and falling of the breath. And then we can recognize that even though we're all online, we are connected no less by, by streams of light, by fiber optics and pixels, pixels of light. We have this immediate connection with each other on this meeting today. And this reminds us of the really deep connection that we have with each other, that whether we are familiar with each other, whether we know each other or not, We've all got something in common already. And that's this deep instinctual yearning and need for, for peace, for happiness, to be loved. A deep instinctual yearning to make something of our life, to bring meaning to our life, to make our life worthwhile. We all have compassion and love in our heart. These are universal qualities. So we can set our motivation. We have our immediate reasons for being here, our immediate concerns, whatever our current uh, problems or issues are. We have our concerns for those around us that we have a close connection with, that we wish we could help better. We have our concerns for society. How can we help the world? How can we heal the climate? And from a Buddhist point of view, actually we can have a similar concern for every single living being because fundamentally they're just like us. We have that connection already. So our motivation can encompass this, the very personal, the global, the universal, everything that we learn and contemplate and discuss in, in this course, we can determine, may it be of the utmost benefit for ourselves, for everyone we come into contact with, and may we be able to benefit in turn, like ripples on a pond, the whole world without putting any limit on it, all the way up to complete healing of anxiety and depression, complete inner flourishing, liberation and Buddhahood. So with this vast and big-hearted motivation to uh, inform today's class, I'd like to introduce you to the main topic. <laughs> so the main topic is, in a course on healing anxiety and depression, is don't shoot the messenger. And 
to give you an idea of this, for instance, if we have back pain, and many of you probably have back pain or some chronic pain, we know that the pain isn't the disease. The pain actually isn't the problem. The pain is an indication that there's something wrong. And often that's the first time that we know that there's something wrong with our health is we feel some kind of pain. And normally what we try and do is just get rid of the pain. <laughs> Take lots of painkillers. They work great, beauty, everything's fixed. But the little fine print on those painkillers, what does it say? It says, if pain persists, see your doctor. And so with back pain, this can be, you know, quite a serious thing. If it keeps on coming back, keeps on coming back, just taking painkillers isn't the solution. There's still something else going wrong. And often we will take painkillers until something breaks, until we can't get out of bed one day. And then we go to the doctor and they say, well, you know, now it's really serious. I wish you had to come six months ago there's probably something more we could do. So this is a very familiar story. And even though it's familiar, we still do it again and again, don't we? <laughs> so pain, it's not pleasant, but it's really important. We have a pain system because it's a warning. It's an early warning system. So that's physically. With our mind, our conscience, our conscience is the pain system of our ethics. So we know when we've done something wrong and our conscience pricks us, it's an unpleasant feeling. We don't feel comfortable in ourselves. And again, that indicates that we've done something against our own system of values, our own ethics, and it doesn't sit well with us. And equally, half the time we might say, oh, well, I meant to do it anyway, or we justify ourselves. We try and make our conscience feel better. <laughs> but if we're honest, we know, oh, yeah, I stuffed up there. So there is, we, we have a conscience. Again, it's not necessarily pleasant. It can be quite unpleasant, uh, but it's there for a warning that we're out of kilter. And equally, depression and anxiety, they're the pain system of our mind. So when we have depression or anxiety, it's evidence that there's something wrong. It's actually not the problem. So depression is not the problem. Anxiety is not the problem. It's the pain system. It's actually the, the early warning system. And of course, the first thing that we try and do when we have any experience of depression or anxiety is just try and get rid of it. <laughs> just like we try and do with back pain. We take whatever internal painkillers that we have. So we might try and numb the pain with, um, with drink or alcohol or distraction. Um, serial relationships, all sorts of things. Too much sex, too much eating, too much sleeping. All of those things mask what's actually going on. And if we do manage to take those internal painkillers or we have medication that relieves that feeling of depression and anxiety, we are tempted to think we're fixed. <laughs> which we may be, but we, it may come back again. So instead of thinking that depression and anxiety are the problem, to recognise they're the messenger and don't shoot the messenger. The messenger always gets in trouble. <laughs> no one wants to be the bringer of bad news, um, but it's important. And in a way, they're our friend because they will keep coming back to remind us we haven't actually dealt with the root cause. So if we can listen to our anxiety and depression, we can remove their causes. We can find the causes and we can remove them rather than just mask the symptoms. And that way we can achieve the inner peace that we're seeking. So I hope this um, gives you some courage. <laughs> so... Now, now I've got to convince you it is actually possible to remove them. So how come? Now, now this is where the Buddhist science comes in. So we've got the, the basis, the Buddhist science, is it's fundamental to understand the nature of our mind. And from a Buddhist point of view, our mind, our heart, our awareness, you know, this big encompassing thing, our mind 
is naturally pure. It's naturally clear, naturally good. So when we talk about mind in Buddhism, it's actually a whole lot more. It's not just brain and it's not just intellect. When we talk about mind, it encompasses thoughts. So it encompasses how we think about the world, our worldview, our intellect, our intellectual understanding or confusion. It encompasses all of our emotions. When we talk about mind, the Tibetans point to the heart, <laughs> like the heart of the matter. So our, our emotional state, our sense perceptions, how we interpret everything that comes in through the senses, which can be quite different. Just think, you know, everyone has different taste in music. We've still got the same sense perception of the, the music, but how we interpret it and experience it's quite different. Our instincts, our automatic behaviour. So people will often say, oh, but it's natural to do this or it's natural to do that in this fatalistic way, like there's nothing that we can do about it. So instincts are very deep in there. They're, they're an aspect of our mind, but we can change our instincts too. We can also work with them. And from Buddhist point of view, the instincts of kindness and compassion are the deepest ones of all. So we can rely on them. And our memories also. So when we say mind, it's huge. It's a lot more than, than intellect. And the nature of this vast spaciousness or potential is naturally clean and clear, like the sky. So the sky by nature is clean and clear. It's spacious. There's no limit to it. However, <laughs> how come we're all depressed and anxious and tired and riven with procrastination and doubts and all sorts of things because we keep on pumping in pollution toxic clouds of those disturbing emotions of distortions fears anxieties doubts and we just pump them in every day so our mind's polluted but it's not broken All of those clouds, they're not one with the sky. They arise, they fall away. And just like we saw, you know, when COVID first hit and all the cities shut down and, um, and the skies cleared over Beijing and the water cleared in Venice and you could see dolphins, you know, in, in, the, in the, the main canal. I mean, how amazing was that? So why were we so amazed? Because it's such a kick to see wow, we can clear this pollution and the same with our mind, we can clear the pollution. But we have to stop pumping more in and that's what a lot of this course is going to be about. How do we stop pumping in the pollution? I have this nice little reading from a great book, Buddhism for Dummies. I love these books, not, not least because they've got cartoons in them, nice little comics and things. But, you know, this is actually legit Buddhism. Um, Jonathan Landau, disciple of Lama Yeshi, and St Stefan Bodian. It's really good stuff in here. So here's a little bit from Jonathan Landau. Seeing that the delusions are baseless. None of the negative disturbing states of mind rests on a solid foundation. They are all based on misconceptions. In fact, jealousy, hatred, greed and the like lead to suffering and dissatisfaction precisely because they are out of step with reality. They paint a misleading picture of the world. If you happen to find something attractive, the delusion of attachment exaggerates its good qualities until it appears perfect and utterly desirable. Then... If you happen to discover even the slightest flaw in that very same object, your anger and disappointment may make the object appear worthless or even repulsive in your eyes. What a roller coaster ride of emotions. A man who is totally infatuated with a woman, for example, can't find enough words to praise all her wonderful qualities. But at the divorce proceedings a short time later, he can't come up with a single good thing to say about her. So because the delusions have no firm foundation in reality, they can be overcome by wisdom. Wisdom 
is the positive clarifying mental factor that shows you the way things actually are, not the way you imagine them to be or even fear them to be. The other positive states of mind and heart, such as love and compassion, aren't threatened by wisdom at all. In fact, they are strengthened by it. Indeed, some traditions of Buddhism teach that wisdom, love and compassion are inherent qualities that lie at the core of your being. These positive qualities are deeper and more reliable than the negative factors, which are understood to be overlays or veils. So change for the better isn't just possible, it's actually a return to your natural underlying condition. So I like that, that we don't have to turn into something else. We're actually, it's just like when you remove the pollution in the sky, it returns to its natural underlying condition, which is clarity, which is light. So as we know, though, if you've, I mean, it's winter over there in America. And if you're in America and if the clouds layer is heavy and you haven't seen the sunlight for a while, it's even difficult to imagine what a sunny day looks like because we get so dominated. So it's really important to remember you are not the clouds, you are not the toxic emotions, you are not those disturbances. If you are anything at all, you are the great vast spaciousness of the sky. Those clouds can be quite dominating. That's why I think they're like the big bullies that we believe that that's us, that we are our problems. But no, that's not our ultimate nature. So that has set the scene, I hope, to give you the confidence to then when we start looking at those big bullies, we don't just get all depressed, but we've got an idea of why. If we can understand this, we can start purifying our mind, removing the inner pollution, which, as we know, it's possible to do. <laughs> Another very useful analogy is the airport of the mind. So this is a bit ironic because obviously I put these slides together before COVID when airports were chockers full of people. Um, and then ironically enough, something arrived from the airport, didn't it? The virus. So our mind is like this. There's countless arrivals all the time the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, all arising in our mind continuously. And at the same time, there's all the departures, how we speak, how we act, what we do in the world. And it's going on continuously like a busy airport. And the disturbing emotions, well, they're like those, they're inner terrorists. Lama Zobrimbache says that the disturbing emotions are far worse than any external terrorist. And why I've called them terrorists is because um, some of them are very tricky to identify. Some are obvious, some are disguised. So with terrorists, you know, where there's a stereotype, if, you, if you're Arab, brown-skinned, with a beard, you know, you've got to be really careful in an airport because you're going to be racially profiled. If it was that easy to spot a terrorist by how they look like, we'd all be safe, wouldn't we? Or a drug, a drug runner, you know? But there's a lot of uh, disguise going on. We can't tell. A lot of terrorists are homegrown terrorists that, you know, look just like me. It's hard to believe. <laughs> and with our disturbing emotions too, when they arise, they may not feel disturbing. We may feel that it's a good feeling and we want more of it, but actually it's an inner terrorist. So our first task is to be able to identify which ones are destructive and which ones are positive. And it's not all that it seems because like our conscience, for instance, it feels bad, but we need it. That's what makes us a safe human being to be around. So if we just go on, oh, I don't like that feeling and try and get rid of it, we're actually getting rid of a really good essential part of us. And 
feelings like craving and attachment, when they first arrive, they feel good. Anticipation feels good. So we think it's good. So we want more of it and we follow it. And actually then a whole lot of disasters can happen all the way to gambling addictions. And who are we? We are the little security guard at the airport <laughs> trying to figure out, is this a terrorist coming in or not? So if you think about your mindfulness or your awareness, how's your inner security guard feeling? Are they, are they overworked and underpaid? Are they just thrown into the job with no training? What do I do here? <laughs> You know, oftentimes you might even sit down and meditate, go, oh, I'm going to meditate and make myself feel better. What do I do? Clueless. So we are this poor, hapless inner security guard in this vast airport with pressure and everything. So no wonder we're overwhelmed. And our task is to support that inner security guard, to be kind to ourselves and to to get some training. So that's what this course is. It's supporting that inner security guard to make sure the terrorists never come in and, and do their damage. So this is from Lama Zopa Rinpoche, How to Be Happy. Great little book. The mind is naturally pure, inherently without faults. It is the clear light nature of the mind that gives us the potential to achieve any happiness that we wish. It is the clear light nature of the mind that gives us every hope. It gives us the opportunity to be completely liberated from all problems, from true suffering and all causes of suffering. It is the clear light nature of the mind that lets us achieve ultimate happiness, lets us cease even the subtle obscurations. Pay attention to your mind and your attitude all the time. Guard it as if you were the secret service, as if you were a bodyguard. Approach your mind the way a spy approaches his target. Spy on your mind. Get to know everything about it, what it's thinking, planning, acting out, whether it's working for good or causing harm, and carefully work to interfere when the mind is being negative. So, so far, so good. Before I get into the next bit of the map of how the afflictive emotions arise, are there any questions yet? Any comments? Uh, anything needs clarifying? No such thing as a silly question. <laughs> Yes, uh, hello, <laughs> thank you. Um, I just want to know uh, where the handouts are going to be available. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, so I think, um, I think Sunny posted something about the handouts in the chat, but I think what happens with the chat, if you arrive after, then you can't see it. So maybe Sunny can post it again. I, I sure will. And let me, uh, let me also say that if you, uh, a lot of, if you go to the website for Shantideva Center, in the additional materials section, all of the handouts um, are there so you can print them out. And that includes um, Miffy's wonderful, um, her, 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 um, the slides. The slides, uh -huh. thank you, and so forth. So they're all there. Yeah. But I will and post it in the, in the, in the chat now. Oh, so oh, oh, uh, what is the, the name of the website? Uh, the address of the website? Please. I'll put that. I'll put that in the chat to make to, to write it down. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. You're welcome. So that makes me very happy, Abelardo. Because does that mean that you're really excited about doing the worksheets? Yes, I'm very excited about everything that you're teaching us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, great. So. Let's have a look then at how the afflictive emotions arise. 
So this is like the genealogy of our disturbances, our inner disturbances. And it's handy to know this because, I mean, I, I found it, it explains a lot. <laughs> it explains how come we get so overwhelmed and why even though we, we work so hard at trying to be happy, um, you know, why it takes so much effort and never really lasts. So the map, how the afflictive emotions arise, these disturbed states of mind, the inner toxicity. First off, right at the top, and we may not even be aware of it, is we have this fundamental ignorance. Another name for ignorance and how we know that we have it is confusion. This is a particular type of ignorance, though. It's not just ordinary, like I'm, I'm ignorant of I don't know how to speak French or I don't know how to cook. It's not ordinary ignorance. It's ignorance about very specific things. We have a deep confusion and doubt about specific things. Namely, in colloquial terms, our identity, our potential and the nature of reality. We have confusion about our identity, who, who we are, what we base our identity on, how, how we end up feeling good or worthwhile about ourselves. And often we get it completely wrong, who we are, what our identity is. And because we get it wrong, then of course, all the rest of the mistakes follow. It's really important for us to, to know what our identity is. You know, if you're adopted, you often want to find out who your biological parents are, or you find out who your ancestors were, or, um, you know, if your parents come from a different country, what about the culture of that country? We have this real deep yearning to understand our identity, who we are. We also have confusion or ignorance about our potential and and I'd say we greatly underestimate our potential from a Buddhist point of view from mind science point of view if we understand the nature of our mind then we understand our potential and our potential because the nature of our mind is the same nature as the nature of the Buddha's mind our potential also is to become a Buddha, to become just like the Buddha. But how many of us really feel that? If we felt that, we'd be so excited. We'd never get tired. <laughs> we'd never get demoralized. We'd be thrilled to do all the inner work. So we don't really understand that deeply, what our potential is. And the nature of reality, also we don't understand this. We, we underestimate how interrelated we are how everything that we do matters especially if we're depressed we, we just we feel alienated and apart from the world we don't see that we are affecting the world and all sentient beings all the time so we're out of step with reality this is called the root cause this is actually the very root of all of our problems it's very deep isn't it it's hard to identify so what comes out of that, though, are the main afflictive emotions. So one of them, from ignorance, comes unexamined doubt. We put things in the too hard basket. <laughs> and what happens with that? We stagnate. We remain on the fence. We may even develop a really great sense of guilt. So unexamined doubt is very debilitating and it's counted as an afflictive emotion. And it stems directly from this fundamental ignorance that we have. Then also, because we are uh, mistaken of how, how we identify with ourselves, who we think the real me is and how we find out the real me, issues of pride arise. So we either overinflate ourselves or we continuously need reflection and appreciation from others to feel worth anything. We have, um, we build it up or we knock it down. And from that comes mistaken views. So mistaken views, intellectually held views. 
So all, all the views of racism, sexism, bigotry, prejudice, they're mistaken views. Why are they mistaken? Because they're out of step with reality. Because they're out of step with reality, they cause suffering. Where do they come from? From pride, from, from a mistaken identity. And they're often held to make us develop a sense of pride or worth, but in this really destructive manner. So all of the, um, the disenfranchised uh, people at the demonstrations and things, it comes from having wounded pride. On the other side of things, <laughs> misunderstood, oh, oh, that's right, and then compounded, okay, we get pride and unexamined doubt, we get closed mindedness. It's like being willfully ignorant now. Now it's like, I've got my opinion, this is what I believe, and no matter what anybody says, I get more entrenched in it. So closed-mindedness, it's completely unmoored from reality and reason. But we all know it. <laughs> we all know when we get stuck in our ways and just say it's because I said so. On the other side of things, because we misunderstand the nature of reality, we think our happiness comes from the things out there. And if I had the things out there, I'd be happy. We think our suffering comes from the people out there. If I just got rid of them, I'd be happy. So misunderstanding how things work, the nature of ourselves and phenomena, we have attachment arise, craving, feeling unfulfilled, this great big yawning black hole. But when attachment first arises, when we're craving, we, you know, we could kind of like it at, at the time. Now, as many of you are familiar with Venerable Rabina, when attachment does not get what it wants, anger arises. So this means that we don't know we have attachment. We only know, you know, directly, we only know we have attachment because we have anger. <laughs> anger is the sign that attachment is not getting what it wants. So while attachment's getting what it wants, we're fine. We think we're okay. It's only when suddenly we're in lockdown and we can't go out or suddenly we have to do something we don't want to do or suddenly what we have runs out, then aversion and anger arise and that's a sure, sure sign we've got attachment. And then jealousy. <laughs> so jealousy is when other people get what we want. <laughs> so instead of going, yay, at least someone got it, at least someone has Elizabeth Taylor's diamonds and is enjoying them. No, it's like, whoa, I want them. How very dare they? <laughs> so we miss out on all this joy just from jealousy. So these ones are all called the main afflictive emotions. And we may recognize some of them. We may, we may be bullied by the others. Quite a few we think are our friends. They're the terrorists, like pride and attachment. We think they're our friends. Even closed-mindedness or unexamined doubt, we think they're our friends. Mistaken views, we think they're our friends. They support us. But they are afflictive emotions. They're afflictive because they're out of step with reality. Now, we may not know that we have any of these. We may think we're okay. It's just the world that's at, at fault. <laughs> But what do we have? The symptoms. We have unhappiness. Absolutely guaranteed. If you have unhappiness, you have afflictive emotions. Unhappiness is the symptom. It's like back pain. It's like a conscience. It's like a blister. It's an indicator that we have some disturbance within us. Unhappiness isn't the problem. Actually, unhappiness is the evidence. And it's our friend because it's a pain system. It's a pain system of our whole being. So, in fact, it's a good sign. <laughs> Can you believe it? So, unhappiness has all these different manifestations. So, anxiety, worry, stress. So, when we're stressed, we often think it's because of out there, the situation. Actually, the stress arises within us 
because of our disturbing emotions. If we get them under control, we naturally relax, even when things are going wrong. I, I have a really good friend that the, the worse things get, the more they just kind of go into a lower gear and get this really gentle giggle. <laughs> They've got a sense of black humour and they just kind of laugh. They don't actually get stressed. So stress, depression, fear, paranoia, they're all forms of unhappiness. A more subtle form is just boredom. Boredom is also a symptom. It's unhappiness. Boredom is like the, 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 the lower, more subtle level of ignorance manifesting. Angst, just general malaise. Cynicism, despair, being jaded. All of those uh, symptoms, experiences, they're not pleasant and they're evidence that something's wrong and out of kilter. So what we've got to do with this map is figure out for ourselves what are the main afflictive emotions and trace them back a genealogy because we may be unhappy, for instance, because we're, say, in our family, you might be the only woman out of a family of boys. All the boys got to have the education, the good job or whatever, and you had to stay home and do the cleaning. So there's jealousy. So you can see that the unhappiness comes from jealousy and expectation. So you trace it up that side of the family tree to work on issues of attachment. Or it might come from mistaken views. Mistaken views comes from fear. Fear comes from pride, feeling intimidated. Where does that come from? From actually not really recognising our nature. Or we just may just not have the courage to investigate, to look within, because we don't know what we're going to find. So we just got closed-mindedness, unexamined doubt. And now we're just riven with fear and anxiety. <laughs> So it's important to see which bit we travel up where our particular malaise comes from will help us. Because someone asked His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, what's, what's the cure to, to depression and anxiety? And he said there is no one cure for that because there are many different causes. And the causes for you may be each of those particular afflictive emotions, one or the other. So we've, we've got to be able to investigate our mind and actually be very honest and see what, what's the main one, what's the main terrorist that I'm dealing with. So that's kind of how we can get the courage to listen, listen to our, our, our depression and our anxiety because it is the messenger. It's the evidence something's wrong. And just on a, on a rule of thumb, so whenever... Whenever I'm feeling really bad about a situation and I kind of pick over it again and again, what is it? What is it? What am I missing? So if you feel bad, guaranteed you don't have all the puzzle pieces. Guaranteed you're missing a piece of the puzzle. Often when we feel bad, we can get quite cynical and we can just kind of get quite down on the world and ourselves and think that's it. That's the end of the story. But if you feel bad, you are missing a piece of the puzzle. And somewhere in that map is the missing piece. And once we find that missing piece, we'll have some inner relief. <laughs> we won't feel so bad. Those symptoms will naturally alleviate. So we've got like a really good biofeedback happening. So again, depression and anxiety are a very good um, indicator of how we're going. So I hope I've convinced you that depression and anxiety aren't the problem. <laughs> In the time that we have left today, I wanted to go into the biggies, the really big one, ignorance and unexamined doubt, um, because they, they kind of go through the whole lot. So we've got to tackle them first. So the ignorance right at the top, the root cause, 
the tricky one. This is the one that we've got to keep on working on all the way up to liberation and enlightenment. So I've developed this series of most wanted posters because, you know, we're after the terrorists, right? So we've got to have it. We've got to be able to identify who they are. So that's what most wanted posters are for. We get the characteristics, we check, we go, aha, gotcha. <laughs> so Iggy ignorance. In that vast airport of our mind, how can we spot Iggy ignorance? So like I said, with the types of confusion or ignorance that we have, confusion regarding internal cause and effect. So the, the big meaning of life questions here, folks. And we have confusion regarding external cause and effect, let alone how it works in our own mind. I mean, you just look at the world. Climate change, for instance, no one set out on purpose to ruin the environment. No one goes to work to earn a living, to, to feed their family with the motivation to ruin the environment. And yet it happens over and over again. So why? Because we don't understand cause and effect. <laughs> we underestimate our effect on the world and we see ourselves as, as little pods, little inter independent, just, just me and mine, and we don't see how it affects the big picture. I remember when I was in Singapore and there was all this smog and smoke over the entire city. Where did it come from? Next door country, Jakarta. <laughs> it was their bushfires. What could Singapore do about it? It's somebody else's fire. So this, we, we kind of don't think beyond our own little bubble. External cause and effect. Internal cause and effect. Also, we, we want to be happy. And yet, what do, we, what do we identify as the problem? The messenger. We kill the messenger. We try and get rid of depression and anxiety. We've misidentified what the root cause is. Why do we wake up happy sometimes and miserable other times? We just think it's random. That just means we haven't identified what the cause is. Everything that we experience necessarily has a cause. And we can find that cause. But at the moment, we've got confusion. And at the moment, we can't even identify what the cause of happiness is. <laughs> Most of the time, we look outside of us to get something. So far, that hasn't worked. So huge confusion about that, not because we set out to be confused, but just we haven't had that inner ed education. We misidentify the causes of suffering. So we don't understand what keeps us in emotional bondage. Means we continue to go up and down and up and down. So the first one, the confusion regarding internal cause and effect, that's all the, the Buddha's teachings on karma. The science of um, consequences <laughs> on a very deep, subtle level. And if we understand that, we can really take control of our world, our inner experience. When we misidentify the causes of suffering, that's all the teachings to do with the Four Noble Truths of understanding the nature of suffering, being able to identify the causes, figuring out what we can do to remove those causes and experiencing the resultant peace and happiness. So if it was, if it was obvious, we would have done it by now but we misidentify it. And often when things go wrong, you know, our first thought is to think it's the things out there and, and they're really just contributing factors. Unaware of our potential for enlightenment. As Venerable Rabina says, if we really, if we really appreciated that we could actually become a Buddha in one life, in this life, in this world, the modern day world, we would be jumping for joy. <laughs> you know, the Winter Olympics are at the moment, aren't they? And everyone's putting in all this effort to just, you know, win a gold medal. They think it's possible. You know, those people there, they reckon it's possible. The, the amount of energy put into it. And here we are, we can't win a medal, but we can 
achieve liberation and enlightenment. We just don't know. And the last one, holding our present identity to be true and inviolable. Meaning we just think, well, this is me and there's nothing I can do about it. And we want to, we want to have a sense of worth and who we are. We hold it very tightly. But because it's based on a mistake, it's like sands through, through our fingers. It just flies through our fingers. We can't hold on to anything. So we need to continuously maintain it. We need people to continuously treat us well, give us appreciation. So these are really big things, aren't they? They're really big issues. And this is at the core of all of our problems. And we can, um, we can try and tackle it head on. That's a big, vast job. Or we can start whittling away at the edges and just get started <laughs> on something. There is something that we can do today, right now today, whether we have any Buddhist background or not. We've got some really um, kind of good rule of thumb steps that we can start with. I like the easy way to do things. What can we do to get started? <laughs> steps to overcome ignorance. Number one, enjoy learning what you don't know. <laughs> I mean, if we could just turn this one around, we'd be so much happier. Because when we first start out to do something, if we're terrible at it, how many times do we start feeling bad? I'm bad at cooking, therefore I'm a bad, useless human being. <laughs> You know, we conflate the two or we get a new computer program or a new app and we expect to be able to use it perfectly. Things go wrong and it's like, oh, we get frustrated and then we feel bad. And then we go, oh, stupid app, stupid photocopier, stupid printer <laughs> and we feel bad. So the thing is, if we haven't done something before, of course, we don't know how to do it. No one expects that the first time you get into a car, you know how to drive. We have to learn. And the same with our emotional well-being. So instead of having this perfectionistic idea, we've got to be perfect at everything first go. Wow, that's so much pressure to just go, I'm a beginner and I'm really curious. How interesting, how fascinating. What can I find out about it? And how come we can do this is because we are not our mistakes. <laughs> Just because I'm bad at something doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Uh, you might have gone through a similar school system like the Queensland school system where if you, if you got the answer wrong, you were beaten. And so our education system may have a lot to answer for in this of being frightened to make mistakes of being frightened to look like an idiot. Well, you know, we're all idiots until we learn. Um, even with this book, you know, Buddhism for Dummies, I, I had I used to lead a course on beginner's Buddhism and I called it Buddhism for Dummies, but I had to change the name because um, people got really offended. I'm not a dummy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not calling you a dummy. It's from the book. <laughs> so... You know, a joy in learning new things. And this is where having hobbies is so good because we let ourselves be pretty crap at it in the beginning. It doesn't matter if we're hopeless at it because we're just having fun anyway. That's number one. Um, enjoy being a beginner. Encourage curiosity. Focus on other people's welfare rather than our own. So we shift our focus from instead of what about me and my needs to somebody else. And even if it's just our dog or just our cat is the reason that we get out of bed. There's somebody that needs us. And many, many times, it's not that we have to 
focus on all sentient beings straight away, actually just focusing on one and living our life for them, making sure that we're alive today because who else is going to look after the dog? You know, that our, in a way our pets have saved so many lives, haven't they? So naturally if we, if we shift our focus to others and, and recognise how we actually care about them even if we don't care about ourselves, it's actually more in tune with reality and it relieves the pressure. Encourage your curiosity, that's right. So um, one of the things about this that I would like to mention too, that when you learn a new thing, like if you learn a new hobby, like I learned to crochet and a while ago I tried to learn to play the accordion, didn't last very long. But um, and also when I learned to drive late in life. When you when you learn one new skill, the process of learning, I mean it's very intense, but it transfers to everything else in life. So when I was learning to drive, I was very, very nervous. But it made me super confident with the rest of my life. And at the time, I just started leading these courses and I was really nervous and really shy. Um, I used to call it my torture Tuesdays because I was so worried about leading the class. But then when I started learning to drive, I was so worried about driving and I was so terrified about driving because I didn't have a car. So my practice was the driving lesson that when I had the courage to do that and live through it and <laughs> come home and collapse. The rest of life was a breeze. My classes were a breeze. I wasn't worried. I just had a natural confidence. I stopped calling them my torture Tuesdays. They started coming, becoming the thing that I really looked forward to each week. So it had this transferable effect. So picking up a new hobby, learning a new language, a musical instrument will mean the, the benefit will flow onto the whole rest of your life. It's, it's a wonderful life hack. When you disagree, disagree with the idea, not the person. So this is how to have applied wisdom. <laughs> if you have uh, worked in, in counselling or social work or something like that, you'll be familiar with the term assumed positive regard. And, and this is really wonderful. So if a client comes to you, even if their whole life is a mess, as a social worker or counsellor, you have assumed positive regard. So you're on their side. You see their good qualities and you're seeking to help them. So you're not focusing on all of their, how terrible they are, or how messed up they are, or how you disagree with everything that they're doing or any of that. You're really looking at those deep human qualities. And so this is what we can do with the people that we disagree with. So I pick a politician, any politician, Immediately, I'm just like, I don't like them. But no, <laughs> I've got to cultivate my assumed positive regard. They're a human being just like me. They have hopes and fears and worries. They have people that love them and need them just like me. And, I'm, and so we, we focus on being on their side. And then when we disagree with the idea, we're not going to alienate them. We're not going to back them into a corner. And we actually may be effective in changing bigotry and prejudice. Can only happen if we have assumed positive regard. So that's a really big one. We'll tackle more of that <laughs> in the future classes, how to do that. Another rule of thumb is to reflect when we go to teachings like this or teachings with our precious lamas, uh, when you read self-help books, anything like that, reflect on how the advice apl applies to you, not to others. So I put this in because I often have the thought, oh, you know, reading something, so-and-so should really read this. <laughs> but hang on a second, we've got to apply it to ourselves first. That, that'll keep us nice and keep us humble. And again, it's like, we can understand, yeah, sure, we're all intelligent. Understanding is not the thing. Applying it, oh boy, that's when we go, please give me something simpler. 
something easy. So whenever we go to teachings, even if we've heard it a hundred times before, think how can I, how would this reflect in my life this week? How would I apply it to this issue? Like really bring it home every single time. And it'll, um, it will keep you safe from so many ways that your practice can be degenerated. Strengthen your ethics, what to practice and what to avoid. Figure out what, what to do and what not to do. Try and have a consistent ethical system and try and actually embody them. I mean, this is hard because, you know, many of us say, oh, family is the most important thing. And yet then you go work 12, 14 hours a day and never see them. So there's a, there's a discrepancy there and that's soul destroying. So again, it's to do with applied ethics. And we need to, we need to be our own advocate in this. And lastly, to overcome ignorance, remember how we feel is not how things are. This is particularly important because when we're feeling really down, we may not identify that it's our blood sugar levels low. We're low in sleep. The sun hasn't come out for three weeks. We've got a really disjointed home life. None of those things. We just feel low and we 100% identify with it and we think everything's doomed. So that's called believing the appearances. So it's not a visual thing, it's the experience. Our experience is actually an appearance to our mind. But we, we don't even have that uh, kind of metacognition. We just are overwhelmed by the experience and we think this is how things are. Things are bad. <laughs> I'm doomed. The world is doomed. So to start whittling away at that, which is that's the fog of ignorance and it's debilitating, is to remember, even though this is what I feel, this is what I think, this is what I believe, it's not true. So just having that little doubt, that's like the little chink in the clouds there, a little bit of light coming through. That's how we can remember that above the cloud layer, there's, there's sky up there. So I had a friend that, um, uh, immigrated from England to Queensland, Australia. And I think he was about 18 or 19 when they came over. So he lived in, grew up in East End, it was st still a slum then. And, um, you know, England, I don't know how many days of the, of the year that it's just grey, low sky, <laughs> clouds. And so when they got on the plane to come to Australia, it was daytime and he had a window seat. And as the, as the plane's going up through the cloud layer and it comes into this infinite blue sky with the sunshine, he's like, oh, my God, it's sunny up here. <laughs> Who knew? What a revelation. So that's, that's with us too. It's so difficult to remember. But at least you can go, yeah, what I'm, what I'm feeling, it's valid. It's a feeling. We're not denying that. But it's not true. So that'll help alleviate the pressure just to get started. And another way that we can do that to remember that the appearances are not the reality is to just start describing it, like describing the clouds, describe the feeling, describe the thoughts. And just in the act of describing them, capturing them, they stop dominating us 100%. So if we try and do those steps to overcome ignorance starting today, um, that will create a really um, kind of open-hearted attitude for the rest of the course and for the rest of our life.
So then the other one of the biggies, unexamined doubt. <laughs> you might have seen that movie, Mrs. Doubtfire. Well, here we've got Mrs. Deluded Doubt. And uh, so unexamined doubt is really debilitating. So here she is. She's at a crossroads. Do I go this way or that way? She's got earrings. Yes, no. This one, that one. <laughs> and they say doubt is like trying to sew with a with a two-pointed needle. You know, you push, if you sew, you push the needle in. Instead of going into the fabric, it goes into your finger. <laughs> so here she is, Mrs. Deluded Doubt. She is stuck. So we all know the feeling of doubt, don't we? The two-pointed mind just stops even ordinary things. I remember one time here when uh, we'd finished a course and we wanted to go to the movies. It's like, oh, which movie are we going to go to? Oh, I don't know. Should we go to this movie or should we go to that movie? So what do you think happened? <laughs> no movie. <laughs> An hour and a half later, we're still trying to figure out, oh, no, I don't know if I want to see that one. Or, uh, uh, should we even bother going to the movies? And, you know, then, oh, session's finished, no movie. <laughs> so this happens in our life. If we, if, we're, if we go to the, we're investigating something, we get to the point, we go, oh, I don't know about that, and we stop, then it's a big problem. In Buddhist psychology and understanding the nature of our mind, we get to the teachings on rebirth, on the continuity of mind, how when our body dies, our mind continues. And we go, yeah, I don't know about that. Right there, it's like putting a roadblock. If you put a roadblock there, it stops all development of intellectual understanding and emotional freedom. But if from the inside we really work on this understanding, this experience of con the continuity of our mind, how even when we're asleep, deep sleep, we have no awareness and yet the alarm goes off and we wake up. Why? Because there's a continuity. The mind hasn't stopped. So if we really get that, if we really understand the nature of our mind and keep on working at it, examining our doubts, naming them, capturing them and writing them down and pinning them down. What is it that's stopping me? So it doesn't mean we have to come up with all the answers, but we have to keep asking. And so my approach to this is to, whenever I'm nutting over something, often I'll go on the same track. It's almost like, like a song, you know, you just this question, that question, this question, I don't know. <laughs> So when I'm nutting something through to make sure that I don't get stuck, I always try and have a new thought or a new question come up. And I don't stop until I get a new one, till I get one more question or one aha moment or a new, oh, I didn't realise that, then it's okay. So that's the difference between examining and just ruminating and getting more and more stuck and entrenched in our beliefs or our worries. So it's okay to not know. You can go, I don't know. I'm going to have to find out. What are the things I have to find out? Who should I ask? Who's reputable? All of that. And I mean, that's something that we're not even taught in school, how to figure out what's, what's a valid source, <laughs> how to use reasoning and logic. You know, we all count ourselves as modern human beings. Um, how many of us know how to actually use reason? If we use reason and we come to a conclusion we don't like, we just go, oh, no, I don't believe in that. <laughs> Completely inconsistent. So th this isn't taught at school unless you go to some amazing school. It's, some, it's a skill we have to learn late in life, and I found that's quite shocking. In Buddhism, we're encouraged to question everything. Question, question, question. Don't be scared of questioning. Don't be scared of having a silly question. Any question is good. 
and encourage yourself to have questions and to not know and feel okay about not knowing. The Buddha himself said, you know, don't, don't believe what I say just because I'm the Buddha or because I said so or because other people believe me. Take it on and check it out. If it's worth its salt, it's going to become clearer to you. If it's rubbish, it's just going to disintegrate. So we don't have to fear. <laughs> Oren says, oh, that's why we need a thimble. Yes, that's right. So a thimble is our applied wisdom. Then we can sow, then we can deal with our doubt and we don't hurt ourselves. So unexamined doubts, psychologically, where do they come from? Often from fear, maybe getting, getting it beaten out of you to stop asking questions, maybe um, from fear of what the answer is going to be. We're catastrophizing. We, maybe, we, you know, we're scared of fear itself. From guilt, oh, I shouldn't be thinking that. Oh, I shouldn't have that bad thought. So we can't even identify it because we're too guilty about perhaps we're really bad. But they're those clouds, those toxic emotions. They're not you. Could be just from laziness. <laughs> yeah, boy. I mean, that's me. I just like, oh, do I have to think about this? I don't think about it until there's the emergency. And then it's like trying to learn the language on the plane on the way over. <laughs> it's too late. Just bad habits. Just not having a nice system. And often, because most of the study that we do, it's under duress, it's not, it's not necessarily exciting and uplifting. We've forgotten our curiosity. And we might just have really bad um, uh, emotional discipline that when we think about things, we tend to think about all the negatives first. Or we tend to get stuck in a rut and not ask ourselves a new question. So that's just a bad habit. But we let them run us, run over us. And the whole um, progression is stopped. It's like unexamined doubt is the roadblock to everything, <laughs> which is why it's, it's like a, a diluted, um, afflictive emotion unto itself. So Aryanagarjuna says, those who doubt powerfully have the power to realize the truth provided they investigate their doubts. So that's the thing. Have courage. <laughs> and then we've got wrong views. Oh, okay. So I got in trouble when I <laughs> one time when I put this picture up. Someone said, oh, how very dare you put up this kernel of wrong views. Well, you know, my family went through the Second World War and all of its terribleness and were captured by the Nazis and then recruited by the Nazis, then captured by Stalin and then recruited by Stalin, then sent to Siberia, then survived Siberia, then fought for freedom, all of these things. So, you know, Colonel Wrong Views, though, is tricky because he, if you just look at his face, he looks like a nice family man but informed by what's called wrong views. So wrong views, it's nothing to do with morals. It's to do with are they in step with reality or out of step with reality? Do they cause harm or do they help? That's the defining thing. And so many times we can have wrong views um, and we think we're, we're good and right. I mean, many of us know so-called religious people that have the full confidence of their, you know, good Christian background or their good Buddhist background, and yet how they act is horrible. It's actually full of pride. We might have, we might have been brought up with wrong views. You might have been brought up in a racist family, and so you didn't even know you had wrong views. And you know, if you're like me, I'm I'm a white woman, so I have. The, the privilege of my station and I wouldn't necessarily know if I was being racist. If you're a guy, you may not necessarily know you're being sexist because um, if we're born into a position of privilege, it just seems all normal. 
So wrong views are really insidious, but what happens? Wrong views are intellectually held. So it's where we have this racism or sexism and then we justify it. Where we explain why we're right, why we're better than others. So in terms of our everyday society, they're the most obvious wrong views, all the isms, sexism, racism, um, you name it. And we all suffer from it a little bit in some form or another. And it's important that we can recognise it in ourselves and own it and try and do something about it rather than try and justify why we're right. There are other forms of wrong views though that are more subtle and they are um, from a Buddhist point of view, having um, a really fixed idea of who I am, like this is me. And then when it gets shaken, we get very, very defensive. So if, if you've been aging over the last few years, you notice there's a difference from when we thought, oh, this is me, young and youthful and full of beans and we think, oh, that's me. <laughs> and then as stuff starts deteriorating and your face starts melting down and your knees start hurting, you just go, that's not me. <laughs> and a whole lot of suffering comes. Maybe you start feeling worth less. So all of that suffering comes from having this identity of this is me, when it actually it's very fleeting who we are. What we identify with is very changeable. And if we rely on it, we're in big trouble. All of the fights in the world come from this, from protecting our identity. We have the extreme views or the isms, but also nihilism and eternalism are counted as extreme views. So often we have an idea of eternalism, this sense of me that goes from life to life. And then in Buddhism, we hear, oh, no, there is no inherently existent I. Then we go, oh, therefore I don't exist at all. <laughs> One extreme to the other, both extreme views. Why are they extreme? Because they're out of step with reality. How do we know? Because we suffer. They create unhappiness. So again, if we've got unhappiness, we've pretty much got extreme views. We just don't know it. And then on top of that, we can compound it by holding wrong conduct as right conduct. So things like um, we might hear in some cultures, um, honour killings. We might hold that uh, profit matters over the climate. We might think that cheating on your taxes is okay. All of those things where we're holding wrong conduct to be right. Now, they're relatively easy to deal with. It's the real inner ones to do with our identity that are the hardest. What we, how we can tell we have wrong views is if we can ask ourselves, especially when we meet new people, do I feel relaxed and open-hearted or do I feel defensive? So if we feel intimidated or defensive, we've got wrong views. We're mis misapprehending reality right there. We're forgetting that these are other human beings just like us. We're forgetting the whole context. We're forgetting our potential. We're forgetting that our identity that we have fundamentally is the same, <laughs> regardless of the outer packaging. So again, um, assumed positive regard is very helpful for this. So I'll tell you a little story just before we get to the, our little conclusion. Um, so back in my 20s, um, walking through Brisbane, going out to various clubs and parties and whatever, and so I, I didn't drive then and also I drank, so I was lucky I didn't drive. Um, but walking around, me and my girlfriends, you know, late at night, it was a little dangerous. And one time we were walking into the city and the Salisbury skins were coming up the road. So these skinheads lived in these uh, the western suburbs of Brisbane. 
really big, really muscly, covered in tats, terrifying, big boots. And I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to pick on us little punks. They hate us punks or gothics or whatever we were. And um, and I knew that if we showed fear, it'd be all out. We'd just be bashed up like, the, you know, bash everybody else up. So I saw that they had a little kid with them, a little mini skinhead, also with the boots and the and the braces and the shaved head. And so immediately I just went, oh, that's really good. You've got your kid here with them and you're showing them an alternative way of life. Good on you, mate. And they went, oh, yeah, we're really good. And then suddenly they were all friendly to me. <laughs> so, you know, even in the midst of an emergency, it's in our best interest to find that little scary that we have in common and find it and and pull up its potential so that they have the ability to rise into their best self. That actually can be um, life-saving, <laughs> you know, just even in an ordinary circumstance. So we've gone quite quickly over ignorance, unexamined doubt and wrong views, but you can see how they, they're like a little family pod, aren't they? They, they interact with each other. So we do have a, a few moments. Um, if there are questions, you know, anything that's, that's really sticking with you or that you're really wondering about, please do ask. Put your hand up or, um, oh yes, Abelardo, go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, at the beginning, you said we, we, we should know our identity then later, we should not uh, be fixated on, on, on believing our identity, you know, is eternal or something like that. It, it sounds a little bit contradictory. Yes, that's right. Sorry about that. It's contradictory because we've got a relative identity and we have an ultimate one. And we mix the two up. So our relative identity is, you know, our, our age, our gender, our race, our culture, our education, our family status. And that's usually when someone says, oh, who are you? That's usually what we say. Oh, you know, I'm Miffy, I'm a woman, I'm Australian, I don't have children, various things. But all of that that we think of as me is making up our identity. It's ephemeral. It changes. It changes over time. You might be you know, identify with one culture, you become a refugee, you come over to another culture. You know, how many refugees in Australia? When they're in Australia, people think they're, you know, Italian. When they go to Italy, people think they're Australian. <laughs> it's a changeable thing. And the, the suffering comes is because we hold on to that as if it's ultimate. We hold on to our age, our gender, our... Um, our culture as if it's completely fixed and unchangeable. And then when things change, we have a nervous breakdown. Whereas actually our true nature um, we'll find isn't what makes us different from everybody else. Our true nature is what makes us the same as everybody else, our, our common human condition our hopes and our fears, the fact that we want hopes and we don't want fears, that really deep yearning for meaning and happiness. But how many times do we identify that as the real me? If we did, we would feel instantly connected to all living beings. We'd never feel alienated. So really what happens is we get the two mixed up and what we base our identity on it's not an ultimate thing. It's very circumstantial. Um, okay, so Oren, yes. Um, you said there are no stupid questions. True. Well, I feel so overwhelmed with information. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, sorry. I'm thinking, gosh, no, I'm thinking, gosh, couldn't this be spread out between three? three different classes but <laughs> i know i just pack it all in i'm so sorry but i want to give you your money's worth <laughs> so i i mean i but 
Um, okay. I do believe that um, that the Chandy Davis Centre will will post the video and things, and then you have the the the, the great leisure of being able to push pause. <laughs> okay, yeah, because they've got to have a special section for slow learners because no dense de dense dense people. I feel like yeah. oh my god. Okay, I'm not a slow learner, but dense mm. dense people. Okay, like me. Okay. Yeah, like me too. And um, and often, uh, and I probably I should have set the motivation better that if we have, if we have this attitude of of being relaxed and you just listen out for the one gold nugget that you need to hear today. So you'll know the thing that you heard where you went, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the thing to continue on for the rest of the week, and and let the rest of it just wash over you and just splash about in it like a nice pool. Or like the bath, you know, just splash about in it. Don't kind of stress too much because just the sheer exposure will help. Um, you know, and I found this, this uh, approach, I mean, it works with everything. You know, I've been trying to rebuild our website and so I get, I get a new plugin. I'm like, oh, I don't understand how this works and I do all the tutorials and I try this and that, do all these experiments. They all look disgusting. And I'm like, I give up. I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. And then I go to sleep and then something happens when I'm asleep and I wake up in the morning, I go, I know what to do. And I go on and get onto the plugin and I know how to use it. I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm cheating. <laughs> but what it is, is this process of immersion. So so let yourself go really deep in, 100% immersion, completely overwhelmed because you're just splashing about in it. And then relax. And that's all you need to do. A few things will come to the surface and things will come into place if you relax. So actually, I don't, I don't think you're being dense at all. I think, you know, it means that you've clearly been tr concentrating really hard. So good on you. <laughs> Thanks, Oren. Um, Steve. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm having some difficulty parsing this concept of unexamined doubt. Uh, there are there are many things that I doubt in the world. I I doubt that the Earth is flat. I doubt that aliens are living in Southbury, Connecticut. I I don't. But it, it sounded like you were saying that unexamined doubt is a source of our problems, is a source of our anxiety and our depression. But I don't see that I have much to gain by examining whether the earth might be flat or whether aliens mm -hmm. might exist in Southbury. These are, these are things that I doubt, uh, but they seem relatively benign and harmless yeah. to doubt them. Yeah, that's right. So, um... It's to do with what we're doubting. So the, you know, the Buddha said that the, the objects of knowledge are infinite. Yes. That every, you know, that the universe is filled with fascinating things. But the actual the, the, the Buddha said, while the objects of knowledge are infinite, just like the leaves of this tree, you know, under the Bodhi tree, those enormous fig trees, you know, huge. You can't even count how many leaves are on that tree. Then he picked up a handful of leaves and he said, but but I teach these few things, just these few things here, these couple of leaves. What do I teach? The way out of suffering. So, so that's the thing. And I found, you know, there's many things I'm really, really interested in. And I can spend years being interested in them, but for what? So the same thing. There's many things that we might doubt, but for what? We've got to pick what we're doubting. And often what's holding us back on an emotional journey or a spiritual journey is really deep-seated doubts about the nature of life, the universe and everything. And they're the ones that we've got to tackle. So you're absolutely right. A whole lot we can put aside, they're irrelevant. But um, we probably know, we'll be able to identify we have unexamined doubt. You know you have it if you have fear. So if you have fear or worry, you've got unexamined doubt because there's stuff lurking there that we're just going, <laughs> Okay, but 
when you were discussing unexamined doubt, you were talking about one of the things that you suggested perhaps we should not doubt is the concept of rebirth and reincarnation. And that's something oh, no, that no, I'm, no. I'm actually not willing to examine. I'm, I'm no, actually... no, I didn't. I, I didn't say uh, we, we shouldn't um, just leave it there unexamined of I don't know. We should have the courage to investigate it. Yeah. Okay. It's but, almost like if so you can worried... still investigate and come to a conclusion for us, we can say, yeah. I've resolved that issue. It's yeah. not a doubt for me. No, that's and, okay then. That's and all that's right. okay. So it's not, yeah. you're not suggesting that there are some things that we need to believe in order to make progress. No, in in fact, from from a Buddhist point of view, there's no there's no place for belief. It's not on belief. It's it's on evidence. But um, just like with, you know, quantum physics, the evidence is very subtle and you need to have really sophisticated technology to get at it. Yeah. So things are not necessarily obvious, but um, the, more, the more you learn, the more it's not just belief or hope, but actually um, based on reasoning and logic and your own experience. So, so yeah, it's, it's the unexamined part that is the roadblock for us. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the doubt is not a problem. It's the unexamined part. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yep. Doubt, okay. doubt is good. Unexamined doubt, that's where the problem is. Okay. Yep. Um, Venerable Tendon Pal Young. <laughs> Hello. Um, so nice to see I... you here. Oh my goodness, Niffy, oh, this is so wonderful. So um, thank you. So my question is actually, it's about what you're not calling homework. I, uh, it, you know, the sheet, I think the, the sheet, uh, well, what does it say, healing? And I'm not sure how you titled it because I already changed it to homework. You know, it's, it's a long document with questions. And- yeah, um, Just one it, page. It, it, so we just do the first page. Uh, no, well, it looks like overcoming uh, the first, it looks like there are six different sets of questions, but the yeah. first one is overcoming ignorance and mistaken views. That's it. it. That's just, that's the only one that you do. Okay. And that's like 13, yep. 13 uh, questions. All right. Yep. And, um, you know, it's another thing. I'm just, there are some people here who, we are all on another website together through uh, the universe, through the UU with Pamela. And, um, you know, just related to what Oren said, I was already thinking that I might reach out to some people if we want to have a meeting, you know, if we even want to have the courage to answer the questions and have a meeting, you know, halfway in the week and um, yeah. kind of flub our way through like that. My, I would find that helpful. I think so, it would be, be wonderful to do that because, yeah, I know, we always run out of time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this, like I really, with this course, I just tried to make it super practical, something to get started with. But um, that's also why it's so good to have those reflection sheets because, you can come back to them again. You can do the course and then in a month's time afterwards, you know, let it all settle and then come back and just do them again mm. and you'll see there's changes. Thank you. So, um, so wrong views, we've gone through those, intellectually acquired, distorted views and beliefs. They're out of step with reality. They're often when we justify things, justify our prejudice, bigotry, misogyny or racism. So now here's the goodie. Who we have, instead of Miss World or Miss Universe, we've got Miss Innate Human Intelligence. And this is us. We're all a winner. <laughs> you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama so often talks about your innate human intelligence. And what we have, the Dharma or the Buddha's teachings, the Buddhist psychology, that's like this umbrella. It protects the mind. So instead of um, trying to stop the rain or stop the hail or stop the sunshine, that's impossible. And yet we try and change the world out there all the time first. 
All we need is an umbrella. <laughs> What's the umbrella? It's the mind protection, this, this attitude of the Dharma. And that with that, we can meet any situation in life with this kind of confidence as being a winner. So because we have innate human intelligence, as a human being, we have all the tools and resources that we need to liberate ourselves. We have everything within us already. We, we're just not used to using those tools. We don't, haven't recognised those tools. We haven't had training in how to use them. But we have everything already that we need. So we should be really heartened by this. We have everything that we need already to dismantle all the disturbing emotions entirely and at the very least to become a safe, happy human being. <laughs> and we cannot stop the reign of misfortune whilst we're in cyclic existence, whilst there's climate change, whilst there's all of these things. You know, we, we can't, as one person, stop the reign of misfortune, but we can protect our own mind from harm. And we can protect others from harm. So this is, if we want confidence, this is how to have confidence in learning how to protect our mind from harm, not from kind of a, just a pep talk. <laughs> so in summary, our mind, it's naturally pure. That's our nature. We really have to work hard on recognising this. All of the disturbing emotions have ignorance at their root. Not evil. We're not broken. We're not evil. Nobody's evil. At the root is ignorance, confusion, mistakes. And because they're mistakes, they can be overcome. They can be fixed. The pollution is not our true nature. It may dominate us at the moment, but it's not us. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Depression and anxiety are our pain system, the pain system of the mind. And our own depression and anxiety and stress and angst and everything shows us personally where to look within our mind. It's like a very personalised prescription, exactly where to look. It's not somebody else's idea. If we learn to work with this, we will know exactly where to look in our mind. So the homework, yeah, the self-reflection sheet. So there's just that one worksheet called Ignorance and Wrong Views. And in the meditations, there's a really nice one called Mind Like the Sky. <laughs> so even you don't have to do it formally. You can, um, you can just sit with your coffee and read through Mind Like the Sky or, you know, sit on a park bench and read through it. It doesn't have to be formal. Then um, I like giving TV homework and I really don't know if um, in, in America you can get this maybe on YouTube. There is an ABC, Australian Broadcasting Commission program called You Can't Ask That. I'm not sure if it's on YouTube or somehow, but see if you can get it. It's just brilliant because it just explodes all these taboos and all of these people that might seem very other to us by the end of the 20 minutes, it's usually really quite funny or quite, you know, intense. You feel like you have new friends. <laughs> it doesn't matter what series. I, the last one I watched was about ex-famous footballers. I thought, oh, this would be, you know, a little bit of fun. And it was utterly riveting and brilliant. And I, now I really feel for ex-famous footballers, I tell you, <laughs> and all of their catastrophes. So a little bit of TV homework if you can get hold of it. And um, next week we're going to look, we're going to delve more into, into identity. Um, so Abelardo and Steve, hopefully, you know, um, and then issues of what, pride and also um, feeling really demoralised. How to develop self-worth and respect from within. So... We better dedicate, I know I've gone over, but that's because you had questions and I'm so glad. Um, so let's rejoice that uh, we've stuffed all of this information into our mind. Now, let's just let it settle. You know, like 
like all like raindrops settling into the parched earth just let it absorb into you each word like a beautiful drop is just just kind of softening your whole mind the earth doesn't have to grab everything it just holds it all so just think everything's just beautifully flowed into you let it settle um dedicate for your own personal aims those those current issues but also dedicate that that these current issues are actually the doorway to everything that they are the catalyst for our own liberation and then to be able to help all sentient beings so how wonderful let's dedicate for that aim for the complete alleviation of suffering and bringing oneself and all, all others to lasting happiness So thank you so much, everyone, for um for coming along, and uh, I hope to see you next week. <laughs> and take care. Enjoy the homework. See you later. Bye bye. Thank bye. You. Thank you, Miffy. Thank, thank you, Miffy. Thank you. Thank you for your incredible generosity. Thank you, Miffy. Miffy, this has thank been wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So wow. Denzin.